Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Sally Stein, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at Cork Street Swamp Sanctuary. And we're so happy to have you all here today to listen to our Lunch and Learn. And we're also happy to have our presenter, Laura Aguirre, who is going to be speaking to us about Southwest Florida climate messages. Um, before we let her get started, though, I just wanted to mention that um, all attendees are in listen-only mode for this presentation. Um, but if you have a question, please type it into the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, anytime during the presentation, we'll wait probably until the end of the webinar though, to answer the questions. So anytime you have a question, just type it into the chat feature. Um, we'll be recording this presentation as well. And um, on our website, there will be a recording of the webinar for um, future reference. So with that, I'll let Lori get started. Thank you so much, Sally, um, for the opportunity to speak here. And thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your time with us. I'm just going to share my screen right now. And we will get started. All right, so this is just a brief overview of some of the things that we're going to discuss today. One is terms that we're going to use when we talk about climate change. Two is the psychology around climate change and climate impacts and how we can strategically communicate to motivate people towards action. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about a specific opportunity for engagement and communication, which is the Emerging Southwest Florida Regional Resiliency Compact. And before all of that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got to this information and to this advice. Um, so as Ali said, my name is Laura Aguirre and I am, a former high school teacher. And while I was teaching high school, I worked part-time for an environmental organization. I was also on the board, the all-volunteer board of another. Um, and so I spent a lot of time talking about climate change and I spent a lot of time advocating for climate solutions. Um, that's a picture of me at a training. There's me in Tallahassee. And then when I wasn't doing those things, I was trying as much as possible to spend time outdoors to remind myself why I was doing the work that I was doing um, and to luxuriate in the beautiful natural spaces that Florida has and that I love. And at the same time that I was doing all of this and championing climate solutions, I was driving two and a half miles to work every day on a street that a lot of people bike on. Um, and in my defense, I had to get to work very early because I was a teacher. So I often got to work in the dark um, and in Miami, which is where I live, uh, bicycling is a, is a dangerous activity given the state of our, our, our drivers here. And that's not a stereotype. We actually do have um, a lot of, of problems with our, with our bike lanes and with the lack of them and with bike safety. So I kept telling myself, you're not doing this because you're too lazy to enact a climate solution. You're doing this for your own personal health and well-being, but it was still something that bothered me. And then at the same time, because I was young and I was a teacher, I used to save up all my money during the year and I used to go traveling during the summers. Um, and at some point I stopped and I said, well, traveling by plane, um, and I did travel by plane, right? I, I didn't sail to any of these places. Traveling by plane really enlarges my carbon footprint. So am I being hypocritical by advocating for climate solutions, but then taking all of these cross-continental trips during the summer? Um, and then I started talking to other people in my circles and I recognized that I was not the only one having these concerns. Um, my boyfriend at the, at the time, who is now my husband, uh, really is interested in electric vehicles and EV technology, but he grew up working on cars and loves muscle cars. Uh, he's the type of person who can like recognize the car by the sound of the engine. Um, and lots of my friends were just so relieved that they could Amazon Prime things to their house, specifically when they had kids and time was limited. Uh, and I grew up in a Hispanic household where people eat a lot of meat. So even talking to people in my family members, my, my family, they have such cultural associations with um, 
eating meat, especially around holidays or just parents' recipes. And I realized that there were so many of us who were in this space where we were talking about climate solutions, but also just thinking through how those might not gel with our individual actions. Um, and I felt like the biggest fraud. Um, and I started wondering if I was really meant to be an environmental advocate. Um, and I had what some might call a little bit of an ex existential crisis. Um, and I channeled all of that energy into my graduate thesis, um, which was about grassroots climate advocacy and communicating in ways that met people where they were and which acknowledged the fact that we are in a changing world. So I came to this. There are very legitimate reasons why people are not as concerned about climate change as you are, as we are sometimes, or why sometimes you are not even as concerned about climate change as you are. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we are hard on ourselves for not being what we consider like the perfect climate advocates. And this presentation is about how we can accept that we are excellent climate advocates exactly as we are. Um, and that when we're talking to and encouraging other people, we also have to help them see that they too are excellent climate advocates exactly as they are. And if we don't live, breathe, and think climate change, it's for very good reasons. Um, and here are some of them. Some of the ways that we communicate about climate change uh, land differently with different audiences. So technical terms and buzzwords that we use all the time oftentimes don't help us when we're trying to make a human connection. Um, and sometimes they're even more confusing. So I'm gonna talk through a couple of the terms that we use really frequently. There's more that we could talk about. Um, and if you have questions about particular terms that you'd like me to address in the Q&A, please just drop those in the chat if I'm not covering those here. One is just climate change itself. There are so many terms that people use when they're talking about climate change. Uh, changing climate, global warming, changing weather patterns, extreme weather events, warming temperatures. Um, when we're talking about biodiversity, we can talk about climate-driven extinction. And research shows that most folks are familiar with the term global warming um, and that that lands well. That the term climate change can help in talking about effects that seem to counter the idea of global warming. So for example, extreme weather events in the winter, I understand that in Florida and in Southwest Florida, we don't see as many of those, of those blizzards, but talking about other places, that climate change can help folks understand that it's not just warming, but that there are climate disruptions that are affecting all kinds of systems. Um, at the same time, some of these terms have become really, really loaded for some audiences. And so it can be helpful to just talk about the impacts of climate change, to talk about the fact that we are seeing changing weather patterns, to talk about the fact that we are witnessing extreme weather events. Um, and to point to things like sea level rise and warming temperatures and just skip to the impacts straight away. The other thing is that there's been this rise in matching the urgency of climate change with urgent language, using terms like climate crisis, climate emergency, and climate catastrophe. And that works really well for some audiences, but it's really alienating for others. Um, so when just even talking about climate change in general, being able to read the audience and think, is this the type of audience that I should just start with the impacts. Is this the kind of audience that is gonna be galvanized um, by talking about climate-driven extinction and focusing on biodiversity and recognizing that there are just myriad ways that we can address the fact of climate change itself. When we talk about climate change, inevitably we start hearing about greenhouse gases. And if you're in the thick of working in and volunteering around climate change, then this becomes a secondhand term. But the research also shows that folks don't really understand the process of how greenhouse gases warm the planet. Um, 
And it can be helpful to just clarify that these gases are heat trapping gases. Um, and so what they what they literally do, uh, and sometimes this is a metaphor that's used in climate communications training, is create almost like a blanket um, in the atmosphere, right? And just the way that if you have a thicker blanket, you will be warmer underneath. If you have a thicker blanket of heat trapping gases, the earth underneath will be warmer. Um, and it can be helpful to specify that we're talking about carbon emissions, although that's not the only greenhouse gas that we're worried about, but it is the one that people are most familiar with and it's something comfortable that they can latch on to. When we flip from talking about the problem of climate change to the solution, two solutions um, that I'm gonna talk about now are renewable energy and natural climate solutions. Renewable energy literally means um, resources that can be naturally renewed, right? And so in, in, in Florida, that means solar for us. In other places, that means wind um, or geothermal. And sometimes folks talk about clean energy instead of renewable energy and clean energy um, generally means energy that has reduced carbon emissions. Um, but it doesn't specify the idea that these are naturally renewed. So whenever we're talking about solar, one of the things that we want to focus on, of course, is that solar is renewable, it replenishes itself. And then we want to highlight on top of that, that solar is clean um, and will give us cleaner air and water that solar is local. And what we mean by that is that it reduces our dependence on foreign energy sources. Um, and again, safe, safe for the environment, safer for our health. And when we're talking about natural climate solutions, there's a whole lot of jargon that sometimes gets a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna walk us through it um, and then talk about the best ways for communicating this to different audiences. So green and natural infrastructure or green and natural climate solutions are sometimes used interchangeably as though they have the same definition. And by some accounts they do, and by some accounts they don't. But they are all nature-based solutions. So when used separately, Green infrastructure or green climate solutions mean things that mimic natural processes. These are things like permeable pavements, um, green roofs, uh, increasing urban tree canopy, bioswales. So these are engineered solutions that are made to mimic nature. Natural climate solutions would be nature itself. So we're talking about forests, um, we're talking about wetlands, and we're talking about watershed restoration, we're talking about conservation protection, we're talking about barrier islands, oyster reefs, sand dunes. And it is important that people understand the benefits of both of these. So when I talk about it, I usually just talk about nature-based, meaning green and natural, and underscore the importance of the fact that we need to look to nature for solutions, right? That's how we get our green infrastructure. The fact that nature already knows how to uh, clean water and prevent flooding, etc. And the fact that we need to shore up our own natural defenses. So the work that's happening at Corkscrew, the work that you all do as volunteers at Corkscrew in protecting the wetlands, in protecting Florida's natural spaces, it's important that people understand that wetlands clean water, that they store floodwaters, um, and that they're carbon sinks, right? That we need our wetlands to be able to store carbon and that if we don't have healthy wetlands, that carbon goes back into the atmosphere and then we're just exacerbating the problem. So with all that being said about this, 
always just explain when you're communicating about these, what the different impacts are. Um, and I would say when you're talking to other folks, don't worry about getting the jargon right, just highlighting the message that we look to nature for climate solutions and nature itself is a climate solution. Um, and then last of our terms, I just wanted to talk about sustainable and resilient because these are the buzzwords of the, the decade. Um, and so my advice would be to always define these because sometimes when words get used so frequently, they almost lose meaning, right? Everything is sustainable now, everything is resilient now. But what we mean by sustainable and resilient is that something is able to withstand shocks and stressors over a period of time. And that we're not just surviving, but we're thriving. So if I'm gonna say that something is helping us be more resilient, then we wanna know how that's helping us be more resilient. So for example, when it comes to wetlands, because wetlands store floodwaters, and because as we move forward into a warmer future, we're going to see more extreme weather events, and in Florida that means hurricanes, it's really important that when we get that shock of a hurricane, that we've got the natural infrastructure to absorb the storm surge, to absorb the floodwaters. That's what makes us resilient. Um, and we wanna make sure that we tie that to cleaner, safer, healthier communities, um, responsible investments of money, and to the fact that the things that we want to keep surviving um, these shocks and structures are our businesses, our homes, um, our way of life that we enjoy. And just as a note, I did want to add that research shows that people are not responding really well to the terms eco-friendly and green anymore. They find them somewhat outdated um, and really relegated to the environmental nonprofit sector particularly, and not as applicable to business and other industries as the terms sustainable and resilient. So still good terms to have in your back pocket, but being able to define them for folks and really have them visualize the communities that we want in the future is important. So that takes us through the terms. And that's one reason um, again, why folks aren't as concerned with climate change as we are sometimes, we've got to do the work of explaining. Um, and as volunteers, you know how important it is to be able to connect people um, to the things that you're teaching them. And I'm sure that you're all, all wonderful educators in that way. Um, and we've got to do the same for climate because climate change is hard to see. Um, it's all of these different impacts around the world, separated by time, uh, and so we've got to make climate change personal and local and have some climate stories ready. Um, research indicates that when people have the ability to talk about climate impacts that they can witness or that have happened to them, um, they're more open to engaging in solutions. And the thing is that most people don't talk about climate change a lot. This is um, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communications data from 2020. Uh, for Collier County and uh, only about 27% of people say they hear about global warming in the media at least once a week. Um, and 35% of people say they discuss global warming occasionally, uh, but we would like for that to be more. Um, of course, the, the, you know, the news is full of climate stories, um, but a lot of the climate stories in the news are also quite dreadful, um, as this indicates. And it's not that these stories aren't important, um, but the stories that are more important are the ones that people can relate to and also the ones that indicate solutions, the ones that indicate that people are already acting. And this is because social conformity is kind of hardwired into us. Uh, just in, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, standpoint, individuals who chart their own paths uh, sometimes have a rough time of it. And um, humans sometimes operate under what's called a conditional cooperation, which is that we want to see that other people are contributing to something before we feel safe 
doing it. Um, so one way to do that is to emphasize consensus. This is from the same Yale program on climate change communication. For Collier County, 67% of people believe unequivocally that global warming is happening. Um, only 53% of people think that most scientists think that global warming is happening. Um, and this too is what the research shows that many people tend to underestimate the, the number of scientists that think that global warming is happening. And many people tend to underestimate the other people in their community that believe in global warming um, and that are engaged in either actively working on it or would just be willing to espouse climate solutions. Here's that same report, but focused on policy. Even though only 67% of people believe that global warming is happening, 86% of people think that we should fund research into renewable energy sources. Um, over 70% think that schools should teach about global warming. There's a lot of consensus around regulating carbon as a pollutant, um, about providing tax rebates for energy efficient vehicles or solar panels. So the truth is that there's already a lot of consensus around climate solutions, even if there's not as much consensus around climate change itself. Um, and so that's instructive for us, right? One thing that we can just say is point blank, yes, scientists are convinced. There's a consensus of scientists because there's a consensus of evidence. But the other thing that we can do is help people see all of the people that are already engaged in climate solutions in the community and in the country. And we can do that by sort of like rethinking the traditional messengers that we think about. Um, and so one that I'd like to go to is Ford. Uh, this is in their strategic vision. They specifically say that the risks and opportunities associated with the changing climate are shaping the way we do business. It is our belief that the freedom of movement drives human progress and that shaped by this belief, we aspire to become the world's most trusted company designing smart vehicles for a smart world. In 2018, uh, Ford announced that they were going to have by 2022, 16 electric vehicles and up to 40 hybrid electric vehicles as part of their lineup. They're coming up with a fully electric F-150. They're coming up with a hybrid electric F-150. So Ford recognizes that electric and hybrid electric cars are their future. They're already doing this. Another thing is that um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and among others, a lot of doctors are recognizing that climate is a health problem. And so they really stress that climate change is not about a distant, unforeseeable future. It's about the world in which our children live today and the future in which they will raise their own children. And so they've been advocating for things, for example, like switching from diesel school buses to electric school buses to reduce the pollution that kids are inhaling on their way to school. So this is another messenger that I go to and another solution that I go to as well. Um, and sports are actually doing a lot of this. So Major League Baseball has taken the lead, I think, among um, all of the other sports, but they're not too far behind. Um, and baseball, I think, took this lead, particularly for the reasons that are outlined here. Um, environmental stewardship resonates with all of us who love baseball and seeing it played on green grass and under blue skies. As we strive to fulfill our social responsibilities, the national pastime will continue to protect our natural resources for future generations of baseball fans and set an example about which they can be proud, right? So like people have memories around baseball that have to do with being outdoors. Um, and the Major League Baseball has not only worked to, you know, put solar on some stadiums to reduce waste, but also educate players, have them be ambassadors, and the NFL has done this as well, um, and basketball has done this as well. So my point is that we can speak to 
all of these industries and all of these examples of people who are already moving towards climate solutions. It's not something in the future, it's something that's happening right now. Now, if people are at the point where they are on board, they care, they want to see how they can help, um, we still have to be sensitive to the fact that people have what's called a finite pool of worry. Um, and the, you know, the human brain can only deal with so much stress. I think the, that 2020 is a really good lens through which to view this, that this has been a year in which people have struggled so much and people have had such individual and familiar hardship. And our finite pools of worry oftentimes do not extend to things like climate change because people are worried about bills. People are worried about putting food on the table. People are worried about sending kids to college or taking care of, you know, aged parents, um, aging parents. And our brains have to prioritize immediate threats and concerns. And they evolve to discount, you know, long range events. Um, and when we're talking about climate change, a lot of times the the conversation is, is, is very grim. There's a lot of doom and gloom and we're talking about the mortality of species. We're talking about finitude, right? We're talking about the ends of things. Um, maps of Florida that are just completely inundated or you know, visuals of fish swimming among high rises. And oftentimes people's response to dread is to mitigate it, even if that just means ignoring the problem. Um, there's a, a theory, terror management theory, which was aptly named, developed after a series of 300 experiments too, that showed that when faced with risk, um, people will often rationalize the threat to reduce um, the dread and the anxiety that they feel about a behavior that they know is risky. Um, and so that's, that's who we are as people. That's what we do. Um, we try to mitigate our dread. We try to mitigate our anxiety. And sometimes that's by just feeling kind of paralyzed and focusing on other things that we can actually control. Um, and on top of that, people are actually just kind of bad at envisioning the future. Other research shows that when you say the word future, people imagine no more than 15 years into the future. Um, and most people's imaginations go dark after, after 20 years. So when we talk about climate change impacts in 2100 or 2150, a lot of people can't even really imagine that far. Um, and if they are imagining that far, they're mitigating their dread by doing something else. So that means that we really have to frame our messages in a way that is positive and that is solutions oriented, um, that helps people to see that climate change is not a future problem, that it's a current issue, um, and that it impacts the things that they already care about. So if we take the three climate solutions um, that are most discussed, energy efficiency, natural infrastructure, and renewable energy. We can identify the short-term gains that don't put climate change into a far off future, but localize it right here in the present. With energy efficiency, we get lower bills. With a focus on natural infrastructure, we have reduced storm surge and flooding. And when we move to renewable energy, we get cleaner air and water. All of those things can also be framed in ways that address kitchen table issues, things that folks are worried about day to day. Um, so with energy efficiency, it's affordable living. We are currently in, a, in an economy that is very difficult for folks. Um, and so in addition to providing a, you know, a healthier world, and in addition to focusing on climate solutions, we can also do so in a way that just helps people. So when we're more energy efficient, we're also helping people live more affordably. The same thing with natural infrastructure. If we restore coastal wetlands, if we protect our blue carbon ecosystems, it helps to safeguard homes and it minimizes the risk of flooding. Um, and water damage when we have those big storms go through. 
And if we're talking about renewable energy and we're talking about cleaner air and water, then we're also talking about public health and we're talking about, you know, people not having as many issues with asthma or other conditions that can be aggravated um, by pollution. And lastly, we want to remember that people are driven by logic. They want to understand that solutions will work and they want to know how they can work. Um, but people also have values and we're motivated by values. Um, I became a volunteer for an environmental organization because it mattered to me. Um, and I suspect that many of you are propelled by that same motivation, right? It's not external. We're not doing it for reward. It's because we love it and it matters. So when we're talking about energy efficiency and affordable living, we're also talking about protecting families and communities and, and that matters. When we're talking about natural infrastructure, like yes, it's flood control, but it's also because the natural world is beautiful. <laughs> right? And because we want other people to have the experience of walking through it and enjoying it. Um, and when we're talking about renewable energy and we're talking about cleaner air and water, we're also talking about people getting to make that choice for themselves, right? Getting to make that choice for their families to be able to say, I want my energy to come from renewable sources because I want to be able to provide that kind of world for my children. And as we're doing all of this, we have to try really, really hard to not let the progressive perfect standard get in the way. And that progressive perfect standard is what was hurting me so much when I was teaching and worrying about flying and worrying about biking because I had in my mind what an environmental advocate should look like. Um, and when I put the picture of myself next to the picture of that person, they didn't look the same. Um, and I have to thank my mentor and professor Paul Feigenbaum at FIU for introducing me to this term, which he coined in his book, and also to helping me navigate this because in his work on civic advocacy, he really stressed the fact that we shouldn't hold up models of the perfect advocate um, and that we should instead embrace all kinds of advocacy, embrace all kinds of action and help people on their journeys, right? So if people think that to be a climate advocate, they have to grow all of their food in their organic vegetable garden and they have to pedal to work and they have to reduce their waste consumption so that they only produce a thimbles full of waste per year. Um, and they make their own clothes from recycled dish towels or whatever it is. Um, then that's impossible for people who are so far away from that and who have finite pools of worry and who don't have the time. And so if we are kind to ourselves and kind to each other in recognizing achievements and in recognizing the different types of advocacy that exist, then that goes a long way in communicating to people that they can make a difference in exactly the life that they live and with the skill sets that they have. Um, and to do that, we've got to emphasize specific roles for people to play. So in summary, we wanna make sure that we give climate change and climate solutions presence. We gotta bring climate communications out of the future and into the present. We share stories and encourage storytelling so that people see how climate change is already impacting them in their lives. And we also illustrate norms and emphasize consensus. We show people that people are already on board with climate solutions, that people are already doing it, and then we have to do this in a way that gives people hope. Um, so sharing local solutions and illustrating people's roles in achieving them, showing how climate solutions address everyday problems and inspiring people to support their values. 
And to cap out the personal story that I shared at the beginning of this, I will say that that's how I got out of my funk um, and wrote my thesis and dedicated my life to climate advocacy because I found a group of people in Miami who literally told me, you can do this. Um, and you can come with us to this commission meeting and you can share your story and your voice matters. And you don't have to be an expert and you don't have to be a climate scientist. You can be a teacher. You can be Laura Aguirre, the teacher, and you can make a difference. And their belief meant everything in the world to me. Um, and so I like to say that I am, I am proof <laughs> that sharing those messages really does matter to people and helps bring them on board. People want to join a community of people that believe in them. Um, and people also want specific actions. And so I'm going to share one specific action uh, that is important uh, in the Southwest that we can coalesce around when it comes to communicating about climate change. And that's the Southwest Florida Regional Resiliency Compact. Um, so first, I'd just like to talk about what a regional resiliency compact is. Um, and it's an agreement between members, which are county and municipal governments, to collaboratively identify, prepare for, adapt to, and mitigate climate change impacts. Florida already has a couple of these compacts or collaboratives. There's one in the Southeast, which is the longest running one, which has been in existence for over a decade. There's one now in East Central Florida, there's one in Tampa, and there's a, uh, one in, in Jacksonville, which is just the metro region. And so the emerging compact in South Florida would unite this region here. And the goals of the compact are really to facilitate regional cooperation. It's the understanding that climate change doesn't know municipal boundaries, right? It's not like flooding stops um, when you hit the city line. Um, and so because climate change is larger than a city, larger than a county, it really makes sense to have regional cooperation in addressing these issues. The other thing is that it's an opportunity to share sound science and technical data, right? So modeling climate impacts and preparing for them. Again, climate impacts don't stop at county or city lines. So the entire region can benefit from modeling and from data that will help them then address uh, climate plans or resiliency plans for the future. Um, and that's the, the ultimate goal is that there's an action plan. Um, that gives suggestions for municipalities and for counties as they're working on their own goals. And there are many benefits to working uh, through a compact and I'll just talk about a couple of them that can be shared. One of them is that it offers opportunities for additional resources, tools and expertise, right? So because resources are being shared across the entire region, uh, municipalities that might have a smaller tax base get to benefit from the same tools that a county would benefit from. Um, the other thing is that because of the climate modeling that happens and because part of the solution is to shore up um, and protect natural areas, it also helps to protect vital bird habitat and help wildlife as well. Um, I want to emphasize that the goal of a compact is to support current local resilience efforts. It in no way supersedes the autonomy of any city, of any town, of any county. Um, it is there to bolster the work that is already being done. The other thing is that the regional voice is much stronger in applying for funding and resources for climate solutions. So state funding, federal funding, grants. You've got the entire body of the Southwest advocating for this. Um, and then there are also really good opportunities for public-private partnerships and positive impacts for employment once you get to the stage where solutions are already being enacted and the plan is being implemented. So, of the three counties, Charlotte County has already voted to join the compact. And you'll see here on the right, the municipalities that have already voted to join the compact. 
So the ones that are not in orange, I should clarify, are the ones who have not yet voted to whether or not to join the compact. And so one thing that can be helpful is to communicate support for the compact. This can be done through letters to the editor, if you are social media savvy, by creating social media content, by just actually having conversations with people who might not know about the compact or might not know about the benefits of a compact. Um, and by also sending letters or emails to elected officials and articulating why a compact would be important to you as a person, to you as a business owner, to you as a corkscrew volunteer, and the benefits of having something like this for the region. Um, and so I will share my contact information here. If you have any questions about anything in the presentation that I don't get to address in the Q&A, or if you have any questions about the compact itself, I'd be happy to speak to you and talk more about how you can get involved. I can share some more details. And I also wanted to share here the information of our organizer in the Southwest, Hallie Goldstein, who's been working on this um, throughout the last couple of months. Her email address is here as well. Um, and so if you've got questions, feel free to reach out to both of us, one of us, we'll be happy to talk through it with you. And I just wanted to say thank you again for the opportunity. Um, and I hope that as we continue to move forward uh, in Florida and in Southwest Florida with climate solutions that we can all take this to heart, recognize that there's a lot that we can do and that we're already doing and that the more that we talk about it positively, the more that we normalize it with the folks that we're talking to, the better we're going to have communities that are willing to engage and excited about engaging in the solutions we're talking about. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Um, I, I really appreciate the um, ways people can get involved in trying to um, get the the resiliency compact um, in the minds of our elected officials as well. So um, there were a few questions. Um, one of them was, how do wetlands store carbon? I think you were talking about that early in your presentation. Yes, okay, so in, in the soils. Um, and so I can, I can give a short answer to this or I can give a longer answer to this, but I will start with the short answer and come back to it if we have time. Um, and a good example to use is just the um, Everglades itself. Um, and so at the southern end of the Everglades into Florida Bay, we're seeing a lot of peat collapse from sea level rise. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the vegetation decaying. And when that happens, the carbon that's trapped in the peat and in the soil and the carbon that's trapped in the vegetation goes back into the atmosphere. And the same is true for seagrass beds, the same, and that's why, um, for example, when there are fish die-offs and things like that, and it's all, um, and it's all tied up with seagrass die-offs as well, you've got the additional carbon from the seagrass dying. So the message that we wanna give people is that we wanna keep carbon in our blue carbon ecosystems. We wanna keep carbon in our wetlands. We wanna keep it in the soil. And that if our wetlands decay, that carbon goes back into the atmosphere and we're just exacerbating the problem. So that's the short answer. <laughs> if we have time right. for a longer one. <laughs> no, we, we do have a few more questions. So thank you, that, that helped explain um, how we're losing carbon to the atmosphere and the loss of wetlands as well. Um, another person had a question about permeable pavement. Um, they had never heard of it before and noted, because they live also in Miami, how many homes there have concrete front yards. And um, he wonders if there are any resources you can point to um, that can help um, towns and developers consider permeable pavements. Um, I would be happy to follow up with that, actually. I don't have any off of the top of my head that I can name, but I do have some stored in my laptop. So 
if I can capture that person's contact information, I'd be happy to follow up with them. Um, there's different companies that are producing different types of permeable pavement and permeable concrete. And there are some pilot projects too that I'd be happy to talk about that are happening in Miami. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, another person stated that in 2016, state employees in Florida weren't allowed to discuss global warming on work time. Um, so now every community has to, by law, consider sea level and resiliency in their 10-year plan. Um, so are we trying to influence government perceptions to um, convince more of the public that, that this is actually happening? If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think the question is, are we trying to influence the government to influence the public instead of just trying to go through the public? Yes. Um, and the answer is yes. I mean, we wanna have this conversation at all levels. Uh, and so part of the work that I do is in encouraging folks to reach out to their elected officials. Those are conversations that we have on our own as well. And also just being cognizant of where different governments are, right? And that that varies across the state, that varies from city to city, that varies from town to town. And the most effective climate communication is the one that mobilizes people. So if you know for a fact that you're communicating with someone who is somewhat reluctant on these issues, then being able to show the positive impacts to businesses, being able to show the importance to tourism, those are the places to start. Um, so I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> and um, many ways to, to do that. Right, okay, thank you, Laura. Um, also, um, someone asked if we are advocating for safe bike lanes in Miami and other places um, to make that more of a safe alternative for people. That's not something that I work on particularly. However, if anybody is interested in working on that, that is a worthy cause. Um, folks in Miami are already doing it. Uh, I live in Coconut Grove and we have seen bike lanes emerging. Um, and so if you recognize that that's something that folks could benefit from where you are, that's a, that's a, that's a place to start. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, and someone also mentioned that um, um, things like family planning should also be emphasized because the surging world population is a very important topic in global climate change. Um, and then someone also wondered where um, we're going to have this recording available so that they can access it. Um, so it will be stored on the Cork Street Swamp Sanctuary website under programs and the lunch and learns. Um, for other, for everybody to access or reference other people to watch it. Okay, so um, I think that was all the questions. Let me just double check. We missed anything? Um, oh, someone wondered: um, Do we get much help or backing from our governor? So. Oh. The governor's office is, and I think somebody had mentioned this in a previous question, is focused on creating a plan around sea level rise and coastal impacts, um, which is not because that is the only way that Florida is going to be affected, but because that is the way in which we are seeing impacts currently. Um, and at the same time, I think that as Florida has continued to I don't wanna say weather storms, but be impacted by storms. There's a lot of conversation about how to protect our coastal communities from storm surge, from erosion, how to protect businesses and the economy when so many of our coastal regions really, really depend on people coming to enjoy the shore and really depending on people to, to enjoy the beaches. Um, at the same time, there was a bill that passed last session um, and sea level rise projections have to be considered um, for new development, for, for government. So 
there's things that are being done around that. And the more that we can point to that again, the more that we can encourage that, um, the more that we'll be able to multiply the resources and the help that's available. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, also, are there any parks that have projects that demonstrate green um, or eco-friendly infrastructure? In there, the Miami area or anywhere that you're familiar with in South Florida? Yeah, so I can, if, if the person asking is from Miami, I can speak to a couple of projects there. Um, if that, I don't know if that was the particular question. Yeah, they just said do any parks, so I'm not sure where, where they're from, it doesn't say, so. Oh, okay. Um, sure, and you know, if it's, if it's helpful, I don't know if we can communicate with the folks who attended this webinar, but I could also send around a list of those, which I think might be nice. Um, okay, I believe we have everyone's email address, so. Yeah, I could send around a list of those. Um, okay. And if the person who asked that question, I was, I'll was i send her out a list for, for Southwest Florida, but if the person who asked that question wants to clarify and say that they're from the Southeast, um, I can just follow up with them. Okay, we'll see if they write, write anything back. All right, well, thank you very much, Gloria. I think that was the end of the questions that are on here for now. Um, so, oh, she did write, she said she's from Titusville, but she can travel. So okay. Examples. <laughs> but thank you very much. We all have um, a lot of information to take in on this and um, gives us a lot of things to think about. So thank you very much. And um, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak to our volunteers and our audience that attended today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes. All right, so I think we're out of time now, but um, but if you if anyone does have any questions, um, we'll stay on for a little bit. If you have any extra questions, and we'll try to get an answer for you. So thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. All right, everyone's saying nice presentation, great presentation. So, but I haven't seen any other questions pop up yet. We'll wait for another couple of seconds and then we'll say goodbye. All right, I guess, I guess that's it. So, um, so we'll hopefully see you guys back at our next Lunch and Learn when we have that scheduled. It will be put on the Corkscrew website. Um, so just keep a lookout for, there, for that. It'll also be announced in our newsletters. So um, thank you all for attending. And um, we look forward to seeing you at Corkscrew one of these days sometime soon. All right. Thanks, everybody.